Well, hello everybody. My name is Mike Dermanwell Jr. I'm the president of Dermanwell Insurance Group. And what you're about to watch for about the next 30 minutes is our latest version of our safety video that is designed specifically for churches and schools. Now, you, if you've seen this presentation before, you're gonna recognize several aspects of it from prior years. And that's because on this entire subject of safety, there's really not a lot of new information. We're gonna explain a lot of things about how to remain safe in the workplace. One question you might have is, is this really relevant to my job? Is it relevant to my ministry? Is it relevant to even what I'm doing here today? I guess I'd have to answer that by asking you a question. And that is, have you looked at your budget lately? At your school or at your church? Things are tight. Uh, God's resources are being stretched very thin right now. And safety and our workplace accident record is one of those areas that we have control over as an employee. And so if we're maintaining a safe workplace, if we're doing our job, chances are we can control that cost. And that's why we invest our time to help inform you as to how to do that. And so over about the next 25 or 30 minutes, you'll be getting some tips, seeing some scenes from prior years. But I, I hope coming to a fundamental understanding and agreement that this is a very important topic. Now there really is two things that keep me up at night when I'm thinking about my clients and thinking about you. One is, is there accountability in our ministry for all of us acting in a safe manner? Do we have a ministry that encourages risk-taking or unsafe behavior or turns the other way when we see something happening where one of our fellow staff members could get hurt? Well, that's a recipe for disaster. That bothers me. Everybody needs to take inventory of what they're having their people do, what they're allowing them to do. You don't want to take the fun out of everybody's job, but at the same time you have to measure the risks of everything that we do uh, in a church or in a school. Second, um, I think it's critically important that we have uh, the right people in the right positions. When we hire people, we understand that they're physically capable of doing their job. Most of the worst injuries I see today, whether it be in a church and school or any other industry, the employers made a decision about hiring that has immediately placed that employee in physical jeopardy because they simply can't physically handle the tasks of doing what they're doing. So really two things to focus on this year, really at the top of my mind, I'd like to put them at the top of your mind. Hiring the right people that can do the job, that have the physical capabilities of doing that job properly, and then holding each other accountable, making sure that everybody on our campus is acting in a safe manner. If we can do that, we can go 80% of the way toward controlling our costs for workers' comp, keeping our injury rates down, and making sure we have a great and a safe and a fun year. What I'd love the most is if we could, one year from today, look back and we could look at each other and say, we accomplished something. We went the entire year without an accident. That's critically important in this day and age when our ministry budgets are tight, our school enrollment is soft, and there just aren't the dollars available to pay the cost of having excessive workers' comp claims. So sit back, enjoy, and hopefully you'll take something important away from this safety video today. Now, when do we see the most slips, trips, and falls in a ministry? Good question, usually during orientation week. However, we have that exposure all year long because we've got students in nine to 10 months out of the year. I wanna take you back to uh, some things we saw in a typical teach orientation week. See if you recognize a few of these hazards out there. Okay, I'm here with Bonnie. Now, this is not her real name. We're protecting her identity. Bonnie has a confession to make. Now, Bonnie, can you tell me a little bit about how you used to lead your kids back to the classroom? Yeah, I used to walk backwards and watching my kids. But one day I took a really big fall, and I'm reformed. I don't do that anymore. You hear that, everybody? A reformed walking backwards teacher. You, too, can stop walking backwards. Well, when we talk about trip and fall hazards, we talk about tables and chairs and footwear and what to do and don't be in a hurry and all that good stuff. But did you see those little kids just now? Did you see them? Well, let me tell you something. They are themselves big trip and fall hazards. Now, 
The smaller the child is, the more uh, they are apt to get into your personal space. You've got to be aware where the kids are at at all times. We have dozens uh, of people falling on backward over a small child or you know, or you know, the kids you know, come up and grab you around the leg and you fall down and hurt yourself. Happens all the time. So they do look innocent, I know, and they're cute. But see them for what they really are, potentially hazardous to your health. <laughs> this is not what you want to do when you're setting up in your classroom now, this fall because <laughs> this guy right here is playing with fire, okay? No tables, no bookshelves, no chairs, step ladders and ladders only. Caught him in the act. This is live footage, folks. <laughs> I'm an example of what not to do. <laughs> Now, setting up for school can be an exciting time of the year or a time of the year where people wind up hurting themselves. Now, earlier we saw a gentleman standing on a bookshelf, kind of spread out and off balance. This is the proper way to decorate your classroom, folks. Up on a step ladder, straight up and down. Now, let me show you something you don't want to do, okay? And that's this. You don't want to get up on this ladder like this and then start reaching out over here, right? You don't want to do that. Why? Because I can fall right down. So what you saw there was proper, getting up on the ladder and being straight. If you need to move the ladder, just move it. I guarantee you, just the couple of seconds that you save by doing this is going to result in you not falling off the ladder. So you need to move the ladder as you're working. Don't stand on tables. Don't stand on chairs. Now what you see here behind me is, some, is a really nice playground set. I mean, it's really great. Stay off of it, please. Please. It's not for you, okay? It's for the little ones, right? Okay? You want to avoid getting hurt? Don't go on that, all right? Good. Thank you. Not only is this person walking downstairs carrying something but not holding a handrail, and if you look at their shoes, they really shouldn't be walking up and downstairs with those shoes because of the heel. So folks, hold the handrails when you're walking up and down stairs, and if you have to carry something, have somebody help you. I'm with Gabe Laurenti now. Gabe is our loss control manager and a former fireman. Now, we ran across this situation at a school that we're visiting, and Gabe, what do you think about this hallway? Well, Mike, when you're thinking about um ways of exiting a building in an emergency uh, environment, you want to make sure that all walkways and exits are free of clutter. And we'll just take this as an example. Uh, this impedes from people getting out of a building safely. And so I highly recommend that you take a look at your hallways and your means of egress um, so you can keep the area clear uh, in the event of an emergency. Now we know throughout the day we're battling housekeeping issues, right? We have hundreds of kids, we have backpacks, we have all kinds of things going on at school. It's important to manage that effort every day, every minute of every day. So if you see something like this, you need to deal with it. Because if not, people will be tripping and falling, or if they have to get out, it'll be harder for them to do so, and that'll make the students and the employees less safe. This is another one of the things that we see typically is a fire extinguisher um, in a cabinet surrounded by a lot of clutter. And this would impede somebody from getting to the fire extinguisher in the event of a small fire. So you want to, the, the reminder here is to keep the areas clean uh, and clear of where the fire extinguisher is and also electrical panels. You want to make sure that they have enough clearance um, and that's also required by the fire department. Another hazard we see in an office setting are cords that are not properly stowed and battened down, like these here. Now, these are kind of loose. They're sort of loosely bundled. But folks, if you have heeled shoes on, you're working in an office, you're going to get caught on these and you're going to trip and fall. These have got to be put out of the way. They've got to be battened down properly and secured with a uh, tie strip so that you don't trip and fall over them. All right, guys, I think we need to... Uh, Need to get a little shot of these these uh, cords and and uh, hoses here. Unfortunately, I can't file a workers' comp claim against my own company. You don't want to be in this position, do you? Look at me, I'm a wreck. Okay, papers everywhere. I'm laying on the cords.
But too often, this is what happens to teachers, here's the difference. I have people here to help me up. I don't know if your students can do that. Right now we want to talk about ladder safety and uh, this is a A-frame ladder. Um, you want to make sure that the steps and the rivets and everything is in, in good working order before you uh, actually foot, set foot on it. And so we want to make sure that it's sturdy and then grab the, the, uh, the sides with both hands and climb the ladder to your designated uh, height. Um, here we can show that we're, we can change the light bulb no problem. Um, however, uh, many times we have a taller ceiling or a shorter ladder and so we have to take into consideration that if we can't reach it, we just don't just step on the top step here. If the ladder is too short for the job that we have, we need to get off the ladder and go get a taller ladder. Under no circumstances should you risk an injury or a fall by stepping on the top step of the ladder. This would be this area here. Do never step up there because if you do, then you're, it's very easy for you to lose your balance and fall to the ground. So the right thing to do is, is get down off the ladder the way you, were, you, way you climbed the ladder, put this one away, and seek a taller ladder. Hi, as Mike mentioned, um, we want to make sure that we're uh, taking in a lots of fluids. And uh, part of those fluids is, is not stuff like this, like uh, coffee or uh, Coca-Cola. A better choice would be uh, regular water. Uh, it doesn't have to be bottled water uh, or Gatorade, something to replenish the fluids that are lost through sweat. Uh, since we have Larry here today, I'd like to ask Larry, hey Larry, what do you guys do for uh, when you guys get hot or, uh, or, or suffering from this heat? Well, we have access to uh, plenty of water on the campus, and uh, we also have access to Gatorade when the extreme heats get a little hotter around here. So Very good. Uh, we always have uh, plenty of water for all the workers. Great. Another thing to remember, too, is to uh, wear long sleeve shirts and, uh, and seek shade as much as possible throughout the day, especially in these warm days. Now you'll find a document on this DVD that deals with the new heat illness standards. We encourage you to go to the link and download it and customize it for your ministry. It's critically important that you be in compliance with all the OSHA regulations regarding heat illness and we're going to help you do that. What we have here is uh, Tammy's workstation and you will notice that Tammy is actually looking down at her screen. And the reason for that is because it's not adjusted uh, ergonomically. And so if we did a simple adjustment, for example, of lifting the monitor up a few inches, then she wouldn't be looking down at the monitor she would, or the screen. She would be looking directly um, straight forward. And so that will alleviate a lot of the uh, uh, injuries or associated with uh, shoulder, neck uh, strains. Also, the what we have here is we have Tammy's keyboard. There is no, uh, there's no keyboard pad and her elbows are not 90 degrees. Perhaps she's using the wrong chair. Uh, the chair that she's using should have armrest so she can rest her elbows and not cause uh, strain on her shoulders and, uh, and her neck area. Okay, now we've talked a lot about how to avoid getting hurt, but let's talk just for a minute about what to do if you do get hurt. First of all, every ministry needs to have a well-communicated policy for what happens when one of our employees gets hurt. Now, if you're sitting out there right now and you don't know what happens, well, that's kind of a problem. You need to find out. But there should be a program communicated to all of you stating exactly what you should do if somehow you're injured at work. That's very, very important. First things first, you want to report your injury immediately to human resources. You don't want to wait. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to go to the doctor, but you do need to report the injury as soon as possible. The second thing is, if you do go to the doctor and it's not an emergency situation, there's a designated provider on a list that you need to go see. One of the big problems we have with people that get hurt is they some, sometimes they don't keep their medical appointments. 
There's no way for us to move the claim along and get you taken care of and get you back well and where you need to be unless you keep the appointment you have with whoever's treating your injury. So I, I want to remind you that is one of your obligations as an injured employee. You've got to keep your appointments with that doctor. It's very, very important. I think another critical component of what to do when you get hurt is that we need to have some modified duty available for you. So we want to get you back to work doing something, even if it isn't your regular job, to keep you involved in the ministry and keep you involved in, and, uh, and active. It's better for you. You'll actually heal faster if you come back under a modified duty situation. The other thing is, and I want to stress this, once in a while there can be a claim that gets a little messy or a little sticky. Don't go run to an attorney. First of all, it's not biblical. We always want to solve any disputes we have within the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you're having a problem with a claim, you can contact your human resource person, your employer, our office. But there's a lot of steps you can go through before you need to take this to litigation. Now, the reason we spend a couple minutes on this is because the way we handle claims ultimately is going to be one of the big determining factors as to how much that claim costs and whether or not you heal quicker. So you want to do all this properly, and that's why we go through it. If you have any questions, see the person in charge of your safety program or your human resource person, and, and you can get those questions answered. Now, there are certain kinds of injuries where, that we don't necessarily need to go through workers' comp for. If you get a cut, a scrape, a, a minor burn, or an abrasion, we can treat that under first aid. You can go to the doctor, bring the bill back to the church or school, and they can pay for it. And that's going to keep it off of your record, and that's important. Because every claim that goes onto your record drives up your experience modification, which drives up your costs. I know it's complicated, but for the minor stuff, let's just treat it like what it is, first aid. Now about 99% of claims that are out there, there's not a problem with them. But if you do have a problem, you may want to talk to your human resource manager or talk to your supervisor. We'll get it taken care of without going to litigation. The main thing is getting back to work and getting yourself back to where you were before before you got hurt. That's the main objectives of workers' comp. So as we continuously refer to this whole issue of safety in the workplace as a stewardship issue, it is helpful to go to Scripture and take a look at at what the Bible has to say about the employer-employee relationship. You go to Colossians 3.22, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with a sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. This is a clear direction for those of us that are in the workplace and to abide by the rules of the workplace. Now in Colossians 4, 1, 1 and 2, uh, it reads, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. This is a direct call for employers to be fair and just and generous in the workplace. So the employer should provide basic safety training, proper equipment, a good work environment, and in return we should include the issue of safety in our staff devotions and really focus on complying with those as a member of the ministry. So what we can draw from this is that there is a mutual responsibility between the employer and the employee, that the employer should provide basic safety training, proper equipment, and a good work environment. The employee should be uh, cheerfully in compliance with all of these issues because it is by and large a stewardship issue. It is by and large an issue of how we use God's resources. Safety speaks to the heart of stewardship. You know, I put together this little list for all of you. These are the 10 things that none of you should be involved in while you're at work, okay? Because I'm going to tell you, uh, disaster and calamity will follow. I'm going to go ahead and read them to you. Snowboarding and skiing. You know those winter camp trips? Well, I don't want to rain on your parade or snow on your parade, but we have a lot of injuries with, with people snowboarding and skiing that can be avoided. If you're going to do this, do it, do it at a time where you're not being paid as a staff member to do it. The same thing really goes for skating, skateboarding, trampolines, rock walls, surfing. And I want you to make a big mental note about the next one, sports and athletics. You coaches out there that are out there demonstrating athletics, whether it's volleyball, basketball, football, and you're out doing drills with your team, you know, if you hurt, if you tear that ACL, if you 
strain that Achilles tendon. If you blow out a knee, if you hurt a shoulder, it's a worker's comp injury. Those are the kind of injuries that, that, that I showed you in some of the earlier slides. Very critical for you to understand that if you're involved in coaching and athletics, not to do any of that full speed. Now, running, I'm not talking about with running shoes on, jogging around the campus. I'm talking about running through the parking lot, running to get to a classroom, running somewhere because you're late usually in some pretty bad footwear for running. Well, this does cause injuries. And so don't be in a hurry. Don't run because what could happen to you is far worse than being a little bit late to where you're going. Paintball. Yes, paintball. Why would that make the list? Well, we've had two or three big injuries in paintball. Uh, ever take a paintball to the middle of your ear? It's not pretty. <laughs> Standing on tables and chairs. And uh, this is a perennial favorite of those of you that are getting ready and getting your classrooms back in order. So this is the hot list right here. Ten things you should never do as an employee in your ministry. Circle them, underline them, commit them to memory. I think a very big threat in the ministry are, are can really be summarized in 10 huge mistakes that employees make, and they make them all the time. First of all, improper lifting technique. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of a demonstration now on safe lifting. First of all, this is a disaster. Just stop right there, Gabe. Hold it for 5 or 10 or 15 minutes now. There's no muscle structure back here, folks. This is why you don't bend over at the waist. The biggest muscles in your body are right here and right here in the front of your legs. That's why you bend down when you lift. Too often we see, just like this, too often we see people bending over at the waist and hurting their backs. Now, Gabe, go ahead and lift with your legs. That is the proper way to lift, folks. If you do it any other way, you're asking for a back injury. We see this every day, and I think many of us that are out lifting and carrying items in the workplace are lucky we don't hurt our backs because we're doing it wrong and getting away with it. Thinking that I'm invincible, not understanding our age, not understanding our limitations. Wearing the wrong footwear for the job. This is a gigantic problem with slip, strips, and falls. Has to be addressed. Um, I, this can be a sensitive issue for churches and schools. But the bottom line is this. The wrong footwear causes injuries. Those injuries cost ministries thousands of dollars a year in increased premiums. Allowing stress and anger to cloud decision-making. Being in a hurry while you're at work. Never does anybody any good to be in a hurry. Participating in unsafe activities like sports and, and some field trips. All right, one of the real problems we have in ministry safety today are youth pastors and coaching. And it doesn't matter if it's a male coach or female coach, the rates of injury are about the same. And here's how you're getting hurt out there. You are doing full speed athletic demonstration. And I don't care if you're a 21 year old coach or a 51 year old coach, if you continue to do that, you're going to get hurt. I've seen it in volleyball, I've seen it in football, I've seen it in basketball, and yes, even baseball. I've seen uh, coaches hurt their arms throwing batting practice. These are workers' comp claims, plain and simple. And if we're going to avoid having workers' comp injuries while coaching, then you've got to be able to demonstrate athletic technique without going full speed. Now that's it on coaches. Now youth pastors are not exactly safety and risk management oriented. I think we all know that. Probably the last thing they think about. And it kind of sends shivers down my spine to know that they're out on in the gymnasium or outside playing hoops with kids that are usually a lot younger. And usually the youth pastors wearing flip flops or, or something they shouldn't be wearing when they're out playing basketball or, or doing anything else. So remember, coaches and youth pastors, don't shoot an air ball when it comes to safety. Use your head, know your limitations, and do everything you can to keep from getting hurt. Not asking for help when the situation dictates it. Okay, folks, there are going to be times where you try to do too much and it's, and it's going to cause a strain to your back. Look at this big piece of wood over here. Gabe is going to try to lift this by himself. It's impossible. You need to take the time to ask for help, go get a dolly or a cart, call somebody for maintenance. But folks, don't try to lift things like this on your own because again, you're going to hurt your back. We don't want that to happen. 
Ignoring safety hazards. Somebody else will deal with it, right? Refusing to hold our coworkers accountable. And then finally, not seeing safety as a stewardship issue. I think these are the top 10 mistakes that are made by employees. And I think if we just understand that we're confronted with these decisions every day and make the right decision, that we will continue to be a part of a safe environment in our ministry. Now, I've talked about the need for safety training, and, and so what I want to do is sub- suggest some topics. Kitchen and food service safety is always an issue where you have uh, food service in the ministry. Transportation, vehicles, driver training, bloodborne pathogens, MRSA, hepatitis prevention, personal protective equipment and the need to have that, workstation comfort, especially in front of computers, proper use of ladders, preventing trips and falls, preventing back injuries, safe usage of chemicals, and golf cart safety. These are all topics that you can address fairly easily year-round in five to ten minute sessions. The important thing is keeping the issue of safety in front of your staff. If you do that, your record will be clean year after year. Well, by now you've watched uh, for about the last 30 minutes. You've seen all the safety tips you can handle, I'm sure, for this week. But I really would like you to take a few things away from what you've just seen. Ask yourself a couple questions. First of all, am I committed? Am I committed personally to going through this year without injuring myself? Second, am I willing to be part of an accountability team at my ministry that will strive to have have an injury-free workplace for the next 365 days? Am I willing to understand that this is not a joke, it's not something to be unserious about, but this really does involve God's money, God's resources, and the stewardship of those resources. Those are three questions I think if you can walk out of the room after this and you say in the affirmative, I'm committed, then I think you're in for a great year and you'll take a look back and and you'll really appreciate this time. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, you can go to our website, www.dmig.com and you can find all the resources you need there. Thank you for watching.